It's Saturday, October 23rd, and this week's Infinite Construct video is a community Q&A fielding questions from YouTube and beyond. Element Zero writes in, Two criticisms of Numenera and the Cypher system that I've often heard are as follows. One, player options are too limited, meaning that characters get too few abilities per tier. And two, six tiers go too quickly. They continue, While number two doesn't bother me, I'll admit that I often agree with the first criticism, particularly with extended campaigns with the same characters rather than a string of several sessions. And one ability gained per tier can feel limited. They continue, have you heard these criticisms before and do you find them to be issues with your players? Offering some of their own house rule suggestions for addressing these common criticisms, they say, after trying several methods to address number one, too few abilities, I've decided to try something that targets both one and two. I add a step of leveling. In order for the character to advance another tier, players will now need to expend another four XP to gain an additional type ability. This adds an additional investment to the rules as written in investments into effort, edge, skill, and increasing capabilities at a cost of 4 XP each. Thoughts? I have not had the chance to try this yet, but I think it is a clean, simple adjustment for groups that want it. And in a lot of ways, I'm going to say that I agree with your solution to these perceived criticisms of Numenera and the Cypher system. Any house rule that opens up the door to more fun is a win in my book. But I'm going to say that while I have heard these criticisms often, I don't agree with them, and I'm going to go into why. In order to address this question, let's turn over to the Cypher system rulebook for a moment and understand what is offered at each tier in terms of customizability in a best case scenario. Tier 1 grants 4 abilities plus a focus ability on top of whatever your descriptor gives you. Tier 2 gives you 2 abilities plus a focus ability. Tier 3 gives you 3 abilities with an additional focus ability. Tier 4 gives you 2 abilities plus a focus ability. Tier 5 gives you 3 abilities and a focus ability. And Tier 6 gives you 2 abilities and a focus ability. That's 16 abilities from your character type alone plus 6 abilities from your focus, adding up to 22 abilities plus whatever your your descriptor gives you in Cypher System Raw. Numenera appears to give you less abilities, but doesn't really once you try starting to construct Numenera types out of what's in the Cypher System rulebook. Let's take a look at a Glaive using the Warrior type from the CSR as an example. Glaives get two abilities off the bat, Combat Prowess and Physical Skills. That's two abilities you have the option of choosing in CSR. Then on top of this, you get to choose two fighting moves. That's still four abilities, but in Numenera Discovery, the character type of the glaive is a little bit more curated to the setting and the vision of how this game should work, meaning that two of the abilities that a warrior would normally get a choice for are chosen for the glaive, but more on that difference later. While specific abilities that grant certain moves, esoteries, or other move sets are important to customization and player choice, in the Cypher system it's important not to lose sight of the fact that every player can spend effort, up to six levels of effort at the highest tier, reducing the highest difficulty on the chart down to a difficulty 4 and requiring only a 12 on the die, directly influencing the difficulty as a quote-unquote ability by means of using your character's stat doesn't have necessarily the same degree of player agency and maneuverability that you would normally have in a game of 5e, and so I think the malleable mechanic of effort should never be overlooked as a player ability. But that's not all. Players also have major and minor effects that trigger on 19s and 20s. Compare this to your standard D20 approach of just rolling extra damage on a crit. In Numenera, each focus gives you a number of suggestions for your minor and major effect, but since they're suggestions, that implies that there is a tremendous amount of freedom afforded to the players in coming up with their own major and minor effects. If we're only going off on the major and minor effects that are listed in Numenera Discovery and Destiny for the foci, that's one additional minor in major effect each from your focus, and then on top of that, five minor effects and four major effects that you can choose once you roll a 19 or a 20, plus anything you can think of that works with the guidelines on page 105 of Discovery. And speaking of suggestions and more open-ended abilities, players have access to player intrusions, which are sort of like meta abilities, but could also be understood in the same way we view high-level spells in D20 games or even dailies from 4th edition. Each type in Numenera Discovery has a suggestion of more ability-themed player intrusions, but you as the player have complete freedom to think of interesting player intrusions ahead of time, 
or come up with them on the spot. And this is to say nothing of the namesake of the system itself, ciphers, which at a minimum a character is likely to have two of. Sixth tier nanos can carry up to five ciphers at a time. In Numenera, ciphers are typically represented as objects that the players find, but in other cipher system games they can take on the form of spells or plot devices that grant an advantage or ability they wouldn't have otherwise. Given that the core Numenera books come with over 100 ciphers and many more can be found in books such as Sir Arthur's Technology Compendium, the options available to players from these abilities are virtually limitless. Ciphers in a lot of ways are very similar to the notion of prepared spells in a game like D&D. They just get distributed and handled differently. But since they're there, you have complete freedom to use these abilities in whatever way feels appropriate. In some Numenera games, I have house ruled the concept of nanite pools, which can be found throughout the Ninth World. Those trained in understanding Numenera can tap into these where they are found, and with a successful check, they can draw a cipher ability from them, provided it's a cipher they've encountered before. If handling ciphers like loot is a bit too disconnected from player abilities for you, you can always tweak the setting to offer them in a different way. Artifacts can also be viewed as quote-unquote abilities that tend to appear more as physical objects in the game, and at a certain point we're just kind of talking about equipment here, and in Numenera that begins to involve things like automatons and installations and vehicles that can also be constructed. The difference between equipment and an ability, particularly in the cipher system, is more of a semantic one to a certain degree, but given that every character has access to tens of abilities from their type, focus, and descriptor on top of customizable player intrusions, customizable major and minor effects, the ability to lower difficulty tasks through effort, an incredibly versatile skill system that is open-ended, and ciphers and a variety of interesting equipment if you wish to consider those to be player options or abilities, and the variety of short and long-term benefits that can be accessed through XP expenditure as mentioned on page 125 of Numenera Discovery, no, I personally don't find the cipher system to be lacking in the amount of abilities, options, and customizability. But let's talk about advancement and the criticism that six tiers is not enough. I'll say that six tiers is not enough if you run cipher system games like D&D. If your players are doing little else with XP besides filling up an imaginary progress bar at the bottom of the imaginary screen, then it is entirely possible to max out a character very quickly. The first Numenera campaign I ever ran actually ran into this problem. Used to playing Pathfinder, I and the players handled XP in a very similar way, and we ended up with maxed out 6th tier characters in a matter of months. But here's one of the less obvious aspects of the tier system. Each tier is made up of increments of 4 advancements, each costing 4 XP. Each advancement results in either a boost to stats, a new skill, increased edge, or increased effort, or, going back to the question of player choice, a new ability. When understanding that the Cypher system has six tiers of advancement, each made up of four increments, it's clear that characters have 24 levels of advancement to go through. If you award XP with the same frequency and expectation of it being used only to advance a character, then yes, you will likely run through this stuff pretty quickly. Keep in mind, however, that at the very least in Numenera, XP is not rewarded for combat, but rather discovery and story advancement. You may choose, as do many Cypher System GMs, to gate off advancement until certain story beats have been met, or reserve some XP awarded from discovery to be used only for advancement. Given how XP can be used for rerolls, player intrusions, and the addition of short and long-term benefits which add to the versatility of your character both as a fictional entity and an entity in a game, progressing through all 24 levels of advancement is something that can be managed pretty well without house rules, especially considering it requires 96 XP. Given that that is the number of XP required to advance through all six tiers, let's do some math. If you award 2 XP at the end of every session and you have a session every week, it will take 48 weeks or 48 sessions to reach 6th tier, provided that XP is never used for a reroll or a short-term or long-term benefit. At a session a week, this totals up to about a year's worth of games to max out a character. Again, that's an entire year of gaming if 2 XP is handed out at the end of every single session and no player uses XP for any other purpose but character advancement. If that's still too quick for you, you could cut it down to awarding 1 XP at the end of every session, and then it'll take 2 years to reach 6th tier if players only ever use XP for character progression and if you play every single week. If that is still too quick for you, you could only award XP when significant discoveries or narrative advancements are made. My personal approach is to 
set temporary limits on advancement over the course of a campaign. I'll allow players to advance up to a certain amount, say tier 2 with 3 advancements, which itself costs 28 XP or 14 weeks if I hand out 2 XP at the end of each session, which is not something I always do. With character advancement, the Cypher system offers a roadmap for you as the GM to use to structure advancement as it makes sense for the story you're trying to tell. If you try to run a game of Numenera as if it were D&D or a video game, however, you will more than likely breeze through advancement. And it is worth noting that Numenera and the Cypher system are, in fact, different games that structure things out differently. But with 24 levels of advancement tucked into six tiers in the Cypher system, I think that there's more than enough to structure out a campaign that will last a good long while. Zeus Legion asks, in the recent Amber Sentinel one-shot you ran, which begins in Medius Ray, or the middle of characters' perceived life events with an immediately dramatic impactful event, I think that I and the other players seem to benefit in our own prep with the previously on summary I cobbled together with the other PCs prior to the session, at least for the purpose of connecting our characters together and having a framework to build from, as we experience the events you laid out for us in the session. I think it helped spark the MCU-like post-credit scene I tacked on to the session at the end. Did you find this useful from your perspective as a GM? Were there any negatives or cons? If not, is it something you would have others consider using regularly in their pregame setups? Sometimes a one-shot adventure is our opening window into seeing a character for the first time. Sometimes those adventures are effectively what writes the story for that character. In the case of the Amber Sentinel, an original adventure I wrote to place the characters outside the context of the Steadfast or even the Beyond for that matter, where an expedition into the far reaches of the Ninth World goes horribly wrong, forcing the characters to make use of and understand the Numenera around them in order to guarantee the survival of the party and the survivors of the expedition, this adventure can certainly handle a character with no backstory. The events of the adventure, the crashing of the Amber Sentinel airship, can certainly be the beginning of stories of the characters it features, but yes, having Having characters with a bit of narrative prep helps to build that narrative framework, as you put it, to place reasons for these characters to be here. But also, it now frames the events of the adventure as something set in the greater context of their lives and story, more so than a significant defining moment. They, in some ways, have now already been defined, and the events of the airship crash are now things that sit in the greater context of who they are. And while I always appreciate and love these moments where character backstory meets an adventure with its own narrative beats, I tend to always prepare one-shot sessions to assume that this may be the first narrative moments of a character. And when it's not, and there is a backstory, the adventure is now contextualized in a very different and very satisfying way, making room for a final scene that continues the lives and stories of these characters characters with a promise of more to come, which for RPGs is always exciting. Patrick Snyder asks, do you have any strategies for seeding your adventure with loot? Is it all off random tables in the books, or do you have specific items that you include to make sense of the situation and context? Or do you have special homebrew items that you like to include? So, while I always love making specific decisions when it comes to planning out an adventure, I am also very much in love with the tradition of conceptual and chance-based creation of the kind composer John Cage was very invested in, or the work of literary groups such as Ulipo, who sought out to craft techniques that would generate literature with or without the input of an author. It's more often than not from these traditions that I set out to seed an adventure with loot and ciphers. I will often turn to the multitude of rollable tables found in Numenera and the Cypher System books and randomly pull ciphers, sometimes just placing them in an adventure without as much concern for what they do, but more often than not, I will come up with results that inspire me to make other decisions within the narrative. For example, to go back to the Amber Sentinel adventure I was referring to in the previous question, the players, after the crash of the ship, will come upon a mysterious structure in the desert of the beyond. This structure is actually invisible to the naked eye and requires solving a very simple puzzle in a few scenes before in order to bring it into the plane of reality that the players are on. While rolling random ciphers, I came upon the Transdimensional Sense Cipher, which grants a player the ability to see transdimensional objects and other phenomena not ordinarily seen by the naked eye. It was from this cipher that I decided to really 
codify the fact that this structure was of transdimensional nature and origin, and should the players discover this cipher in the wreckage of the airship, this may be what they use to discover said structure. So while I prefer to generate loot in a random nature, it often informs the decisions that I'll make about the adventure as I go along writing it. And after enough time spent doing this, you'll start to remember some of those items and abilities, and perhaps make more intentional decisions into the future. But in terms of homebrew items, I will often add a lot of weapons that grant specific functions on a 19 or 20 on the die, similar to major and minor effects. And while minor and major effects are always something a player or GM is free to improv, I find it's a lot of fun to come up with cool weapons that have added functions when the die turns up a critical hit. I also make use of the iotum and crafting rules to provide opportunities for rights and other characters to build and customize various weapons, items, and other loot in the game. Lord Mawkish asks, Being new to leading adventures in general, I find myself nervous with regards to preparing for many eventualities, coming up with things on the spot in case my players try to diverge in very unforeseen ways. Do you know some good tips and tricks to get things back on track without making it seem forced? I recall that Numenera stresses the importance of adapting, for example, making the players' choices and letting the story follow their choices instead of railroading them. But that feels like such an elegant thing to manage, and I'm not sure I can do it right from the first session. I completely empathize with this, and in my early days of running adventures, especially Numenera, I too was intimidated by the amount of prep it seemed I had to do, on top of being able to improvise when players made unexpected choices. And while it is true that these days I spend a lot of time prepping adventures, I do so only because for me that's where a lot of fun in playing RPGs is. I enjoy cracking open these books and rolling on random tables and finding interesting setting places and concepts, and then weaving them together into an adventure I think will be a lot of fun for the players to experience. One of the cool things about Numenera is that you can quickly make changes behind the scenes to ways that you've prepared in order to keep an adventure going, and you don't always have to worry about it being planned out. If the party misses a key piece of information, use a GM intrusion to give one of the characters a glimmer from the data sphere that gives them a hint. If the party goes wildly off track from the destination you thought of, offer a teleportation device that brings them to where you intended them to go anyway. If you have a specific destination or narrative beat that you wish to happen in the adventure, nothing is stopping you from doing a bit of behind the scenes revision in order to bring it back into the focus just in a different way. If the players don't go off to explore the ruin where you prepared the climactic event to occur, place that climactic event at the end of where they are going, or provide some means of getting back to that area with an alluring phenomena. And in the ninth world, there's no shortage of strange emanations of the data sphere, disruptions in reality from transdimensional spaces, mysterious objects and artifacts from far off planets, or just awe inspiring vistas filled with impossibly ancient creations of the previous world. Narrative cohesion is often not real until after the events of the adventure happen, and with both the weirdness of the setting of the ninth world and rules like GM intrusions, there are a lot of opportunities for you to reintroduce what you've previously prepped regardless of the decisions the players make. Also, to end this answer, it's important to understand that this is something that may take some time for you to develop a sense of. The more games you run, the more you'll get a sense of the adaptability and flow that is sometimes required to tune into an RPG. The only way to get there is to continue to run games and spend more time with the books. You'll undoubtedly have some games that don't go as well as you intended, but you'll also have games with moments that you'll remember for years to come, and the only way to make that happen is to get out there and log more hours in the ninth world. I also recommend checking out my discussion with the guys at Cypher Unlimited on session prep. Links will be in the description below. Wrapping up this video's questions, Element Zero asks again, a second question I have. Do you allow your Numenera players to pull abilities from other sources such as the Cypher System rulebook? I often find a character concept can be better realized if a player is afforded access to a few options beyond the Destiny and Discovery baseline. With the CSR rating abilities as lower tier, mid tier, and high tier, I feel that balance concerns are minimized. Thoughts? My personal opinion on using source material outside of the core experience is that new players should dedicate time to understanding what is on offer from the core experience before seeking out more complex or advanced options. Similar to how any good house rule likely understands the parameters of the written rules, so too should any additional options added to a game of Numenera understand where Discovery and Destiny leaves you. 
As I had sort of discussed in the beginning of the video, it would appear that the Cipher System rulebook gives you more abilities than Numenera Discovery and Destiny does, but this is somewhat of an optical illusion. To come back to our example of the Glaive and the Warrior, in the Cipher System rulebook, the Warrior appears to be given four abilities to choose from at Tier 2, while Glaives in Numenera Discovery are given just two, but if you build a Glaive using the Warrior in the CSR, you will quickly see that combat prowess and physical skills, which are given to the Glaive as written, will take up two of the possible four abilities you may choose as a warrior out of the Cypher System rulebook. What this suggests about Numenera is that the types here are in some ways curated builds using concepts unique to the Ninth World as a setting and material that can also be found in the Cypher System rulebook. Taking the reins of that curation and building out more customized characters with the options available from, say, the Cypher System rulebook is something you can do more effectively when you understand how and perhaps why you might want to dive into those extra abilities. Take the Adept in CSR, for example. While the Nano is given understanding Numenera as a starting skill, building the same kind of character using the Adept in the Cypher System rulebook would require you to take the Magic Training as the Magic skill of the Ninth World is understanding Numenera. You could choose to forego the Magic skill in exchange for another Esoteric, either in Numenera Discovery or in the Cypher System rulebook, creating a character that may not have an intellectual understanding of the Numenera, but is still nonetheless accepted gifted with it and perhaps has access to a number of esoteries that your average nano does not. Such a character would undoubtedly have a different relationship to the Ninth World and the Numenera than a nano would, and it could make for an interesting story about someone who is of incredible inborn or discovered talent with the Numenera, activating their esoteries through perhaps a more spiritual or esoteric lens than a more science-driven nano who has spent time trying to understand the Numenera as something to be studied and known would. But this kind of build is made more possible by understanding what's on offer from Numenera Discovery and Destiny, and seeing where something like the CSR or even books like Character Options 1 and 2 can provide additional options for. So yes, I absolutely encourage looking into other books, but I would stress the importance of understanding the rules as written in Numenera Discovery and Destiny in order to gain better insight into what the Cypher System rulebook could afford you in terms of new options. I want to thank everyone who submitted questions for this round of Q&A, and be sure to keep an eye out for another opportunity to submit your questions on running Numenera and Cypher System games. You can also drop a question in the comments section of this video, tweet me over on Twitter, or send me an email through theinfiniteconstruct.com to have something featured and answered in the next Q&A video. Until next time, for more Numenera and Cypher System videos, please consider subscribing to The Infinite Construct.